evening. This is our sixth and last episode on the, on the history of Ukraine. And we left the fifth episode when Germany invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. And during the brief time when Russia and Germany were allies, Polish Ukraine became incorporated into the Soviet Ukraine and another section of Ukraine became part of what the Germans called the General Gouvernement, part of the Third Reich or of Greater Germany. During their occupation, the Germans allowed Ukrainian institutions to function, especially Ukrainian language schools. Church life flourished as well. Even Orthodox and Greek Catholic parishes were re-established. And there was also, at least in German-occupied Ukraine, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. And this was the fascist branch we alluded to in the last episode. As it happens, the Ukrainian nationalists, nationalists were split into two factions, which for simplification I will call the Nazi and the fascist factions. The fascists took their inspiration from Mussolini and the Nazis, of course, from Hitler. Eventually, the leader became Stepan Bandera, the head of the Nazi-inspired section. It is the same Stepan Bandera now celebrated in Kiev with his SS and Svastika insignia. However, these internal nationalist squabbles between Nazis and fascist Ukrainian nationalists were to be swept away when Germany invaded Russia with the famous Operation Barbarossa. Hitler's actual excuse for invading Russia was that Russia had taken over small parts of, Ru of Romania, but this, as I said, was just an excuse. The Germans advanced rapidly in Ukraine which became incorporated in what the, the Germans called, as I said, General Gouvernement. The Banderites, as they were called then and even now, were arguing for a fascist Ukraine under the umbrella of the, of the Nazis. But the Banderites quickly became troublesome to the Nazi themselves and nothing came out of it, except, except that at the end of the war continued, as, or rather, as the end of the war continued, they were formed into groups set out to fight Russian partisans. And in essence, the Banderites were extreme anti-communist crusaders at the service of the German war machine. In 1941, when Germany invaded Russia and Ukraine, the populace still remember, still remember the famine of 1933 of which we spoke before. Therefore, the Germans were welcome, at least by some, we do not know statistically how many, but they were welcomed by some as liberators. But quickly matters turned very sour. German political theory divided ethnicity into Herrenvolken, the master race, and Untermenschen, the under race who were, who, were to serve, who were to serve the master race. Ukrainians felt the sting of this theory almost immediately. But nevertheless, nevertheless, the Germans were planning to use some Ukrainians, at least so those who took their inspiration from the Banderites, as auxiliary police and militia. And many, many participated in the German machines as concentration camp guards and other supporting roles. Anecdotal evidence shows that the most hated among the guards of the concentration camps were actually Ukrainians. And some viewers may remember that the cases of Ukrainians that emigrated to the U.S. after the war and who were eventually stripped of, the U of their U.S. citizenship after it was discovered that they were the hated guards of the Nazi concentration camps. Quickly, however, after the invasion, Germany set itself to eliminate all traces of Ukrainian independence in contrast to the short time when Germany had been, Germany had part of Ukraine under her control when Russia and Germany, as you, we saw before, were allied. The assumed subhumanness, subhumanness of, of the Ukrainian was captured by a reported quote by a Nazi Reich Commissar who said, if I find a Ukrainian who is worthy of sitting at the same table, table with me, I must have him shot. There, of course, there were rebellions, there were terrible reprisals, and according to statistics, about three million non-Jewish Ukrainians were victims of extermination. There is a ravine, there is a ravine called Babin, 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 what is the name? Babin Yar, Babin Yar, 
which that for two years, starting in September 41, was used as a site for execution and mass burials. In Russia, or rather Crimea, the Germans lay siege to the Sevastopol, who resisted for 250 days before having finally to surrender. As we know, Germany had three key Russian targets to defeat. Leningrad or St. Petersburg to the north, which suffered incredible punishment but resisted. Moscow, whose outskirts the German reached but did not get into. And Stalingrad, which today is Volgograd, where they were defeated. And that defeat signaled the beginning of the end of Nazi Germany, as you know. When the battle finally ended on the 30th of January 1943, more Soviet li lives had been lost at Stalingrad alone than by the United States Army on all fronts throughout the entire war. And in this context, Poland's recent decision not to invite Putin to the commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz must be uh, considered a sign, a sign of immeasurable stupidity. At the end of the war, 85% approximately of Kiev lay in ruin and almost 20 million people were homeless. But still, Ukraine, now again the Soviet Republic of Ukraine, set itself to the immense task of reconstruction. And the reconstruction was, by any measure, very successful. Without any Western aid, because of the Iron Curtain, by 1950, the industrial output exceeded that of 1940, which was the last year of peace. The number of collective farms increased dramatically. Agriculture, however, remained subject to climatic conditions that were not favorable during, immediately after World War II. And during the war, Stalin had decided to make more concessions, again, to the national spirit of the Ukrainians. It was felt that a stronger national spirit would help, to, would help with the overall war effort. Some, national, some, some national heroes of pre-Soviet times were paid tribute to, and you may, may recognize some names we spoke about in previous episodes. For example, the Cossack Bodam Kamenitsi, Alexander Nevsky, winner of the famous Battle of the Neva, and, and the General Kutuzov, the winner of Napoleon in the invasion of Russia in 1812, and others. And there were also openings even towards the Russian Orthodox Church, who elected a new patriarch, and for a while, at least, Ukraine was allowed to have their foreign, for a moment for the, her foreign ministry and, at the request of Stalin, became a member of the independent member of the United Nations. And this was during the short time before the famous Iron Curtain divided Eastern from, from Western Europe. After that, the idea was reinforced that the republics were but elements, but elements of the Russian mind and the Russian soul, so to speak. The very republics would be working to forge a new Russian man whose, whose primary concern would be loyalty to the world's first egalitarian society, thanks to the medium of the world's true revolutionary, revolutionary language, which is of course Russian. As far as the socialization of Ukraine, the newly acquired Western Ukraine had a problem, however. The Galician, the Bukovinians, the, the Transcarpathians, had acquired what we called, what we can call a Central European mentality and created by the decades that they lived under the Austrian, Hungarian, Polish or Czechoslovak Czechoslovakian rule. Their worldview or culture was European, more European oriented and often at odds with the, at odds with the, with the Eastern Ukrainians who had lived for centuries under the Russia czars and for 30 years or more under the, in the, under the Soviets. Well, what linked Western to Eastern Ukrainian was nationalism. The Soviet Ukrainian government had two challenges, to rebuild the economy of Western Ukraine, according to the centralized model, and to integrate the nationally minded um, Galicians with the rest of the Ukrainian population. And all this while there was a still a military movement fightingly open, fighting, fighting openly against the Soviets, the troops, a leftover, a leftover of the Banderites, of whom we have already spoken. The main battle was, however, and as I said, ideological. In Western Ukraine, the old pre-Soviet institutions had to be abolished, 
including the non-Soviet cooperatives, cultural societies and the schools, schools which only a few years earlier had been re-established by the German occupiers. Another, another ideological enemy was the Greek Catholic Church, defined as the ultimate symbol of re reactionary feudalism. And in this, the Soviets adopted the view of the Tsarist regime, namely that Orthodox Christianity was the, was the only acceptable religious orientation for all the Slavs. In Poland, the property of the Greek Catholic Church was transferred to the Polish Catholic Church. And by the time of Stalin's death in 1953, Ukraine had undergone more changes. Its economy far exceeded pre-war levels, and the newly acquired Western Ukrainian lands had become more or less integrated with the rest of the country. Individual national expression was admitted, but only if it recognized Marxist-Leninist theory as interpreted, of course, by Stalin as the basis of a communist social economic system. After Stalin's death, the Moscow Politburo adopted the government of collective leadership. But it soon appeared that Nikita, or Nikita rather, Nikita Khrushchev, Stalin's uh, very faithful to Stalin, was a lieutenant, and he had been a head of the communists of Ukraine earlier on, and he was the leader. In fact, Khrushchev was almost a Ukrainian himself. And beginning with Khrushchev, Russia set herself to achieve the ultimate goal, that is, the transformation of the, socialist union, of the Soviet Union from a socialist state to a fully egalitarian state. There were also attempts to redress the imbalance that favored heavy industrial production over the production of consumer goods and agricultural products for, for human consumption. Also, during, during Khrushchev's rule times, there was a decrease in the, excessive, in the excessive control over cultural life, which was characteristic, as we well know, of the Stalin era. And following Stalin's death, Soviet Ukraine showed, we can say, contradictory tendencies. On the one hand, there were efforts to integrate Ukraine more fully into the Soviet system, and on the other hand, there was some loosening of control by the Communist Party and in the context of loosening the political control from the center came the gesture from Ukraine, by Khrushchev rather, to give Crimea to Ukraine, as I quote, as I quote here, it was another, another affirmation of the great fraternal love and trust of the Russian people for Ukraine. It was a gesture and an example of the friendship among people embodied in the Marxist Leninist philosophy. Crimea had formerly been formally Russian for at least 100 years, and he had been mostly Russians ever since the Tatars or the Mongols, whenever they became integrated, when they became integrated into the Soviet Russian Empire. We're talking about centuries, and Khrushchev, as I said, started the political thaw. There were scholarly and literary productions, no longer, no longer rigidly confirming to the accepted interpretation of established socialist artistic, artistic dogmas. Names that are familiar are, for example, Pasternak, with his Dr. Zivago and his balanced interpretation of the 1917 revolution, the poet Shiev Tushenko and Solzhenitsyn. There were also overtures to the West, with some down-to-earth exhibitions in Western Europe of what life was like in the, United, in the Soviet Union, rather. Trade was liberalized somewhat. In fact, the first job of him who speaks to you now, after his graduation, was the sale of electronic instrumentation to Russia. So I acquired a reasonable view of what it was like to live in the Soviet Union, other than what one heard from the media or read in the newspapers. But when it comes to public relations, the Russians there as now, if I may say, compared to the Americans, were and are amateurs. The image of America as seen from, from the, by the Russians was a land of unlimited freedom, lack of discrimination, and wealth of everyone embodied in the idea that people could buy anything they liked, that is, consumerism. In the meantime, Ukraine was allowed once more to rewrite her history, celebrating the independence of the Zaporozhian Cossacks, 
whom we encountered in our first episodes. Then came Gorbachev with his perestroikas and glasnots. Then came the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. And with the loosening of restriction to foreigners came the fantastic work of various government and non-government organizations which ended with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, to which followed a decade of unmitigated disasters, extreme poverty, collapse of the social system, lifespan reduced by 10 years or more, etc., etc., et Statistics reflected also in the Ukraine. The rest, what happened and what is happening, you know. But now, at the end of our, of our story, how are we going to conclude it? How are we going to conclude it? It is said or believed that all the massacres on the second part of the 20th century, the millions killed in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, the hundreds of thousands killed in Central and South America, the 60-plus attempts on the life of Fidel Castro, the U.S. finance Central American wars were all actions and sacrifices necessary to fight communism. But this, if I may, is and was a colossal historical foible, or a fable, or even a farce, were it not for all the victims sacrificed on the altar of this illusion. Many had suspected it for a long time, but recent events have brought the matter dramatically to the fore. Because, currently, Russia, as you know, is a capitalist nation as any other one, nation as the only one. And yet the rhetoric, the misrepresentations, not to mention the, the lies, are the order of the day. And it's just as if the Cold War had never happened, and just as if we had now in Russia another monster to destroy, as I said, except that now, as I said, the monster, the monster is not communist. Among the possible explanations for such gargantuan inconsistency, there are two, which I conceive as more tenable and by inference more plausible, even though these explanations are somewhat, somewhat outside the box, so to speak. The first explanation has a Marxist tone. For Marx, war is the built-in and inherent and line of capitalism when opposing sides compete for the same markets. And this would explain World War I and it would explain World War II. I will discount the other wars, Korea and Vietnam and all the others, which were wars of conquest featuring a giant armed to the teeth, warring against Third World armies, however combative they were. Combative to the point that in Vietnam, a Third World army defeated the giant. And it is up to you to determine if Iraq, Afghanistan, or Libya were victories, for many they represent actually defeats, unless you consider it a victory, the practical destruction and colonization of a country where colonization is achieved by installing a puppet government and keeping U uh, U.S. armed forces and massive military bases indefinitely, indefinitely in the liberated countries. The second explanation is more far-reaching and has to do with two significantly different worldviews, mostly subconscious, I should say, between what we can call the collective mind of the East and the collective mind of the West. For sure, we cannot point the finger at any one instance of behavior in a person and then take that instance and say it is the effect of an archetypal view of the world, the, the view that transcends the specific cause of that specific behavior. But we cannot deny that such archetypal view of the world exists, if we, wish, if, we want, if we want to call it this way. It was born, if we want to set a date, purely for reference, that is, it was born when the Emperor Diocletian split the Roman Empire between East and West in the, in the third century. Again, generalizing and therefore, and therefore running the risk of a new simplification, we can call the West archetypal view, we can call it empirical, materialistic, and centered on a non-transcendent, non down-to-earth view of the world. In the East, the world, the world view is more ethereal, more spiritual, interested naturally in the course of human affairs, but having as a, as a backdrop an ingrained perception of a world 
as part of a mysterious cosmos, if you like, echoing, if you like, the Zoroastrian tradition and the Buddhist transcendental, transcendent rather, view of, of, of life. Worldviews and the cosm cosmological views that are essentially foreign to the archetypal Western tradition. And it is meaningful that the border, the frontier between the Western and the Eastern Roman empires coincided approximately with the jagged lines of the Iron Curtain, which is in itself a remarkable coincidence and, and it, it demonstrates pragmatically the difference between the West as we know it and the East if we wish to explore it. This archetypal contrast was further reinforced when, through the course of the first millennium, religion became the underlying ideology behind any government, imperial, kingly or, or feudal. The contrast, as you know, eventually led it to the schism of 1054, and again, the limits of the Orthodox faith followed the same lines as the Iron Curtain. And it should be noted, in passing, that there is more enmity between the Catholic and the Orthodox churches than, for example, between the Catholic and the Protestant churches, which could also be considered a reflection of the difference between the respective stances of East and West towards, towards the cosmos. But, someone may ask, how can I develop a better feel for this elusive, archetypal, almost esoteric difference between these two spheres of culture, the spheres of the East and the spheres of the West. In my view, you cannot find the answer in, in, in any specific book or treatise that claims to explain it. However, my suggestion is to read, or, or read again slowly, some of the Russian literature classics of the, of the 19th century. For example, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, the brothers Karamazov, Tolstoy's War and Peace, or the stories of Turgenev, or of Gorky, or of, of, or of the very Ukrainian Gogol, or even some literature of the 20th century, Dr. Zivago, for example, the book, I mean the book, not the Hollywood movie. I named, I named a few, but there are, there are really dozens. Read them, or reread them. And if, at the end of your reading, you will feel different in a way that you cannot even explain too well to yourself, if you feel so, then, then you will probably have acquired an inside inkling or an inside sensation of the difference between the collective Western and the Eastern collective, Western soul and the Eastern collective soul. It does not matter if you or I cannot put it into words. And curiously, cu curiously enough, there is an, another historical reflection of this difference between the ancient Greek, Eastern that is, and, and the Roman, Western that is, Roman mentality. It is not generally known that the principle of converting steam into mechanical power is not the invention of Watts in the 18th century. It is actually a Greek invention by Heron of Alexandria. Among other applications, as the steam <coughs> turbine in this picture, he uses steam to effect the automatic opening and closing of the main door of the library in Alexandria. But you may ask, why did the Greek not develop the principle and the discovery further? Why? We can think of many plausible, many plausible answers. But the underlying reason lies in the essentially speculative, non-materialistic, or if you wish, somewhat ethereal nature of the Eastern mind, of which, in this instance, in this instance, Greece is an example. Speculative nature that is abundantly displayed in the writings of the Greek philosophers of old, from, from, from Aristotle to Socrates to my favorite, the vegetarian Pythagoras. We could say that the East is soul-oriented, as in body and soul. The West is sales-oriented, as in, in buying and selling. But to return to main subject and to conclude our hist Ukrainian, Ukrainian sketches, in the unashamed attempt to make Ukraine part, part of NATO and as such part of the West, and in the reaction that ensued, we see played out, played out the conflict not between capitalism and communism, or the conflict between two imperialisms, but the conflict between two remarkably different views of the world. Every other justification, democracy, free market, 
neoliberal economics, poor verbal, uh, 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 just poor verbal fronts <coughs> for uh, often uttered and, and, and formulas often uttered by eminently ignorant people, sometimes sitting on the board of sundry think tanks. People who make money by repeating what they know is profitable to repeat. And finally, finally, if you have found this panorama on the history of Ukraine useful, I have to say with Shakespeare that all my best was addressing old words new, spending again what has already spent. Or rather, with minor paraphrasing, thus far, with rough and all unable pen, your TV producer hath pursued the story. But it is, it is a story that I thought was worthwhile telling. Thank you for watching. Thanks to our crew. And until next time, I am Jimmy Movia for Historical Sketches. Thank you.